Volume 1, Chapter 7, Part 3 of A Popular History of England From the Earliest Times to the Reign of Queen Victoria This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jennifer Painter A Popular History of England from the earliest times to the reign of Queen Victoria, by Francois Pierre Guillaume Guizot, Chapter Seven, Part Three. During the anxieties which Henry experienced while he was quarrelling with Becket, he had not neglected external affairs, and a new kingdom had been added to his vast dominions, a kingdom insecurely held, however, as yet, and which was to cost England much blood and many errors before being united completely to his crown. Henry the Second had made the conquest of Ireland. After having shone with some brilliancy in letters as well as in the history of religious faith, Ireland had for some time past fallen back into a state verging on barbarism. Originally inhabited by different colonies of the Celtic race, she retained institutions analogous to those of the highlands of Scotland, the clans were called sects. The chief was known as a Carfini, and chose his successor, or Tanist, from his own family, without regard to the laws of primogeniture. When the Carfini died, the Tanist succeeded him, and named his own heir presumptive. The same rule existed in the four kingdoms of Ulster, Munster, Leinster, and Connaught, Enmity and rivalry were constant between these princes. Of 178 kings who ruled over Ireland, 71 were killed in war, and 60 were murdered. In 1169, the King of Leinster, Dermod MacMorrow, having been driven from his possessions, had applied to Henry II for assistance, offering to take the oath of allegiance to the English king but the king was engrossed in his relations with France, and he contented himself with authorising English warriors to support the cause of Dermod if they chose. Having obtained this permission, a certain number of adventurers went over to Ireland, the most notable of whom was the son of the Earl of Pembroke, Richard de Clare, called Strongbow, who took with him a force of 3,000 men. He fought against Dermod's enemies, married that chief's daughter, and had just inherited the kingdom of his father-in-law, when the king, annoyed at his success, wrote for him, recalling him to England. Strongbow immediately crossed the sea, and came and threw himself at the king's feet, offering to surrender the town of Dublin to him. Henry's anger was appeased, and he appointed Strongbow to the position of Seneschal of Ireland. In the following year, the king himself landed in his new dominions with an army so numerous that the Irish soon made a nominal submission. Henry, however, intended not to act as a conqueror. He was taking possession, he said, of Ireland by virtue of an old bull of Pope Adrian, which conferred upon him the sovereignty of this new kingdom by the right which the popes claimed to exercise over all the islands recognising the Christian faith. The Irish bishops answered this appeal by meeting together in council. Several wise measures were adopted for the civilization of the savage regions, where polygamy was still practised and where dead bodies were not always buried. But Henry did not attempt to impose the English laws upon his new subjects. That portion of Ireland occupied by the Normans was alone assimilated to England. The rest of the country remained subject to its old customs. When Henry returned from thence on the 17th of April, 1173, nominating Hugh de Lacy governor of Ireland, he left behind him territories which his armies had not overrun, and an undisciplined population, who took advantage of his absence to rebel. The jealousies of the English noblemen established in Ireland still further complicated the difficulties of the government. Harassed by their mutual recriminations, the king would depose, replace, or recall the rivals. Disorder reigned in all parts when, in 1185, the king, having obtained from the Pope 
the investiture of Ireland for his son John, sent the young prince there with his court. The arrogance, the severity, and the follies of the new sovereign soon caused fresh insurrections. John grew alarmed and returned precipitately to England, leaving to Sir John de Courcy the care of pacifying Ireland. The lieutenant succeeded in this, and, having become Earl of Ulster, he governed the new kingdom with as much firmness as good sense, until, at the end of the reign of Henry the Second, a prosperous state of affairs was inaugurated, to which Ireland had not been accustomed under native kings. Henry had begun to appropriate Ireland to himself, but without being able to give his personal attention to that country. He was a prey to bitter and ever-increasing embarrassments. The crowning of his son, Prince Henry, had excited in the young man an ambitious spirit which his father-in-law, Louis the Seventh, constantly encouraged. He asked for the immediate cession of Normandy, or even of England, in order to be able, he said, to maintain his position and that of the Queen his wife. Wait until my death, replied the King. You shall have wealth and power enough. He intended to bequeath England to Henry, as well as Normandy, Anjou, and Maine. Aquitaine he designed for Richard, Brittany for Geoffrey, and Ireland for John. The young princes had even already been invested with these magnificent provinces. But, encouraged by their mother, the vindictive Eleanor, to whom Henry the Second had always been a good husband, they plotted to seize their inheritance beforehand. In March 1173, Prince Henry, who had slept with his father at Chinon, found a means of escaping during the night and of reaching the territory of the King of France. A few days afterwards, his two brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, also escaped, and Queen Eleanor prepared to follow her sons. But she was captured by her husband's emissaries and brought back to England, where she was imprisoned until King Henry's death. The father had sent to Paris to ask that his son should be given up to him. The ambassadors found the young prince clad in regal robes, seated by the side of Louis the Seventh. We come from Henry, King of the English, Duke of Normandy, and of Aquitaine, Count of Anjou, and of Maine, began the messengers. No, said the king, interrupting them. King Henry is sitting here, and he has commissioned you to deliver no message. If you wish to speak of the king, his father, he is dead, since his son wears the crown. If he still has any pretensions to the title of king... I will soon cure him of them. In accordance with these haughty words, the young prince caused a seal similar to that of England to be made, and declared, by letters addressed to the Pope, to his brothers, and to all the great noblemen of England and of the French states, that he was at war with his father in order to avenge the death of Becket, my foster father, whose assassins are still safe and sound. I am unable, he added, to bear this criminal negligence, for the blood of the martyr cries aloud in my ears. My father is incensed against me, but I do not fear to offend him when the honour of God is the cause. The kings of France and Scotland, the Count of Flanders, and a great number of English and Norman noblemen sided with the conspirators. King Henry began to see himself abandoned by his most intimate friends. He was a match for his four sons. The King of England neither rides nor sails, said King Louis, alarmed by the rapidity of his rival's movements. He is believed to be in England, and he is in France. He is believed to be in Ireland, and he is in England. An army of Brabantines had been raised, and King Henry the Second had called upon all those monarchs who had sons to support him in his quarrel, endeavouring to secure their help by the consideration of the disorder which would reign in their own dominions if their own children followed the example set by the English princes. He had implored the Pope to help him to defend the patrimony of St. Peter, as he called the islands of England and Ireland. The pontiff replied by sending legates to put an end to this unnatural struggle. But blood had already been shed. 
in the month of june 1173 the count of flanders had entered into normandy but his brother who was his heir having been killed at the first siege he retired from this impious struggle and re-entered his states king louis the seventh and prince henry were defeated by the brabantines prince geoffrey did not meet with success in brittany a conference convoked at gisors again excited their animosity the war was carried on with alternate successes and reverses the insurrection had spread as far as aquitaine the scots had crossed the frontier and several towns of england were in the hands of the insurgents when in the month of july eleven seventy four henry hastily left normandy on reaching england he proceeded directly to becket's tomb it was on the morrow of his humiliation and repentance when he was already in his bed overcome by fever that it was announced to him that an attendant of ranulf de glanville wished to speak with him the king inquired whether ranulf who was one of his intimate friends was well my lord is well replied the messenger and your enemy the king of scotland is in your hands the king trembled say that again he said the man tendered some letters to the king it appeared that on the twelfth of july glanville had surprised the king of scotland william the lion in the neighbourhood of alnwick and had made a prisoner of him this good news effected a cure of the king's disorder the people again thronged round his standards in a few days the insurrection was quelled in all parts and henry after this triumph recrossed the sea with his army to relieve rouen which was besieged by the king of france prince henry and the count of flanders a battle took place under the walls of the town which was decided in favour of the king of england the princes were for the time reduced to obedience richard resisted for a greater length of time than his brothers he had acquired a taste for warlike achievements which were to become the passion of his life and he thought besides that he was upholding the rights of his mother to whom he was tenderly attached but he yielded at length an interval of peace at length allowed henry the second breathing time and leisure to organize the great institution which he wished to bequeath to england it was in eleven seventy six that he definitively established with the help of his friend ranulph de glanville the courts of justice where the assizes were regularly held for all the civil and criminal business and which were presided over by itinerant judges who made a circuit from town to town to direct the decisions of the knights of the shire who then represented the jury louis the seventh was dead philip augustus had ascended the throne eleven eighty and war was about to break out afresh king henry who was now reconciled to his eldest son wished to compel richard to do homage to his brother for the duchy of aquitaine the prince refused saying he would not compromise the rights of his mother she was greatly beloved in her hereditary dominions and the poet bertrand de bourne powerful among his countrymen and devoted to eleanor's cause was intriguing successively with whichever of the three sons appeared the most incensed against his father king henry had caused a picture to be painted representing four young eagles attacking their sire if john does not join his brothers he said sadly it is because he is too young richard at length made peace with his father but henry and geoffrey had raised the standard of rebellion in their turn they had invited the king to a conference at limoges eleven eighty three when he approached the town he was saluted with a volley of arrows of which one wounded his horse in the neck ah geoffrey cried the king what has your unhappy father done to you that you should thus make a target of him for your arrows the prince laughed at this bitter remonstrance we cannot live in peace amongst ourselves he said without being in league against my father his brother henry was disgusted at this evidence of his brother's hard-heartedness and joined the king for a while but soon after having been again annoyed he departed and joined geoffrey and the poitevin 
who had revolted when he fell ill at Limoges. In terror, he sent, begging his father to come and grant his forgiveness. The king did not dare to accede to the request. His friends would not allow him to venture into the camp of his sons, who had so recently attempted his life. He contented himself with sending a ring by the Archbishop of Bordeaux, assuring the prince of his forgiveness. The prelate found the young man dying upon a bed of ashes, a prey to remorse and despair. He died pressing to his lips the ring which his father had sent to him, greatly distressed at not having received the benediction upon which he had hitherto set so little value. A few days afterwards, Limoges was taken, and the instigator of the insurrections, Bertrand de Bourne, was made a prisoner. He was brought before the king to receive sentence. He said nothing, and did not defend himself. Bertrand, said the king, you pretend that at no time do you require one half of your talents. Know that in this instance the whole of them would avail you little. Sire, replied Bertrand, it is true that I said that, and I told the truth. And I think that your talents have deserted you, cried Henry angrily. Ah, sire, said Bertrand, my powers deserted me on the day that the brave young king, your son, died. On that day I lost all my powers. The king burst into tears. Bertrand, he cried, it is but right that my son's death should have unnerved you, for he was more attached to you than to anybody else in the world. And I, for love of him, give you your life, your goods, and your castle. The poet Dante did not forgive Bertrand de Bourne, as King Henry had done, for he placed him in hell. I saw, said he, and I seem to see it still, a headless trunk approach us, and the head being cut off, it held it in one hand by the hair, like a lantern. Know that I am Bertrand de Bourne, who gave bad advice to the young king. In the midst of the general grief, a kind of union was effected between the father and his remaining sons, as well as between the father and mother. Eleanor was brought back to Aquitaine and restored to liberty. But this mutual understanding, so rare in this royal family, only lasted for a short time. Geoffrey asked the king to grant him the countship of Anjou, and on being refused, he retired to the court of France. Death awaited him there. He was thrown in a tournament and trampled underfoot by the horse before the attendants could come to his assistance. Henry had two sons remaining. Richard, who was afterwards called Cour de Lyon, and who had inherited that majestic countenance which Peter of Blois attributes to his father, whose almost square head resembled a lion's head, and John Lackland, as his father laughingly called him, who had not taken part in the revolts of his brothers, and whom Henry esteemed very much for that reason. Richard had already shown fresh signs of insubordination. Eleanor had returned to her prison at Winchester, when a call from the east brought a short truce to the hostilities between France and England. Jerusalem had just been retaken by the Mussulmans, 1187. Pope Urban II had died of grief in consequence. Gregory VIII, who had succeeded him, called the Christians from the west to the deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Archbishop of Tyre was preaching in favour of the Crusade. King Henry was the first to respond to the appeal. Richard assumed the cross as well as his father. Philip Augustus manifested the same desire. A conference was held under the elm of Gisors, the famous tree at the foot of which many treaties had been ratified, which had remained in force but for a very short time. The treaty of peace which was there agreed to in the name of the crusade proved to be no more durable than the others, and the king of France in his anger caused the tree to be rooted up, saying that no more perfidy should be witnessed under its branches. It was rumoured that the King of England had the intention of bequeathing his kingdom to his youngest son. Richard had another grievance against his father. 
the latter had for some time been detaining in a castle the princess alice of france who had been promised in marriage to richard and far from conniving at the union he was endeavouring to obtain a divorce from eleanor with the intention it was said of marrying the young princess himself richard demanded an explanation from his father of these two infringements of his rights asking for his father's consent to his marriage and an acknowledgment of himself as heir to the throne of england henry did not reply he at length proposed to marry the princess alice to john lackland richard was not infatuated with her for he already dreamt of berengaria of navarre but he looked upon his father's proposal as an indication of his intentions respecting john is it really so cried he i did not think it possible but now my friends you will see what you little expected and kneeling before king philip augustus he placed his hands in that monarch's and at once did the latter homage for the duchies of normandy brittany and aquitaine as well as for the countships of poitou anjou and maine asking for assistance in recovering his rights philip augustus accepted him as a vassal and liege and immediately gave up to richard the castles which he had taken from the latter's father this time the shot had been sent straight to the king's heart in vain did he retire to saumur to recommence preparations for war his energy and decision had failed him he awaited the arrival of the pope's legates who were entrusted with the care of attempting a reconciliation and contented himself with rewarding the noblemen of normandy who had always remained true to him when the legate arrived king philip augustus who was too clever not to discover the weariness of the old king insisted on the conditions of peace offered at the last conference asking besides that john should accompany his brother in the crusade without which he threatened to cause the greatest disorder in the kingdom henry refused then the truce is at an end said the king of france the legate threatened to place the kingdom under an interdict and to excommunicate philip and richard i am not afraid of your mercenary anathemas and richard drawing his sword cried i will kill any insensate who dares to excommunicate two princes in a single breath his friends restrained his violence the legate remounted his mule and retired in great haste the french marched towards le mans the town was taken and pillaged aquitaine poitou and brittany revolted treason was rife among the english barons henry felt that he was beaten he sued for peace declaring himself ready to accept the propositions of philip and of richard the two monarchs met upon a plain between tours and azay richard was not present while they were conferring in the open field and still on horseback the thunder roared and a violent storm broke forth the nerves of king henry had been shaken by disease and trouble he reeled in his saddle and his servant sustained him with difficulty when he had recovered his senses he was too ill to continue the conference and the proposals for peace were sent to his headquarters they were hard and humiliating an indemnity for king philip permission for his vassals to do homage to richard the restoration of the princess alice to a person commissioned to deliver her with all honour to her brother or her affianced husband on the return from the crusade and so forth king henry the second stretched upon his couch listened in silence when an end was made he asked to see a list of the barons who had pledged themselves to maintain the cause of philip and richard the first name was that of his son count of mortagne the unhappy father uttered a cry of pain john the son of my heart he exclaimed for love of whom i have brought upon myself all these misfortunes he too has betrayed me he was assured that it was so let all things henceforth proceed as they will he said i have no longer any regard for myself or this world and he turned his face again to the wall in the bitterness of his soul his son richard had followed him and leaning towards him asked for the kiss of peace in ratification of the treaty 
the king did not refuse it as he had done before in the case of Becket. But Richard had scarcely left the chamber when the indignant father muttered between his teeth, May I live to avenge myself on thee. He gave orders to be carried to Chinon, oppressed by a profound melancholy, which was succeeded by a violent fever. In his fits he raised himself in his bed, invoking the vengeance of heaven upon his children. Shame, shame upon a vanquished king, a king dispossessed of his rights, he cried. Accursed be the day when I was born, accursed be the children that I leave behind me. He directed his attendants to carry him into the church, where he expired at the foot of the altar on the 6th of July, 1189. He had not yet completed his 55th year, but his features were worn like that of an aged man. When Richard, stricken with horror at the intelligence which he had received, hastened to Fontrevold, whither the corpse of his father had been removed without ceremony, someone had surrounded the royal forehead with a golden fringe in imitation of a crown, and it had been necessary to employ hired horses in order to convey to his last resting place the powerful master of so many dominions. Richard approached the coffin. A drop of blood appeared under the nostrils of the corpse. Yes, it is I who have killed him, cried Richard, stricken with repentance. He fell on his knees beside the dead body of his father, remained there a moment prostrate, then rising, went out precipitately. Ten years later, when Richard was dying at the seas of Chalus, he ordered that his body should be conveyed to Fontrevault to be interred at the feet of his father. End of chapter 7, part 3